Good evening, Twitch. Hello, YouTube. And welcome to Birth of a World. Uh, on this evening's program, we're going to be going through the uh, second adventure site, the ice, cl the ice cave overlooking the city of Tincliffe, uh, and going through and constructing this dungeon and uh, populating it with monsters. Uh, and that sort of thing. And that's probably going to take uh, the entire show this evening. So let's let's pull up the uh, ye oldie text editor and take a look at what this dungeon's supposed to be like. Um, for anyone who's new to the stream and just joining us uh, this week, um, this is an interactive podcast, so you're welcome to hop in the chat and say hello. And uh, feel free to shout out suggestions and answer, uh, give out ideas and answer questions if I ask them. I will say I am getting over a cold, so I'll be coughing quite a bit in this stream. Uh, apologies in advance. So, uh, in our story of Red Potato, we talked about our um, second. So we talked about our first started started adventure weeks ago now, <coughs> uh, which was just going to be the mine basically under town, just to let the players get used to their characters. Now we're dealing with the second adventure, which is an ice cave located up the valley from Tincliff. Basically, after they've helped the townsfolk out with uh, opening up their mine, uh, the party gets sent up the valley because the tracks aren't clear and they can't leave yet, uh, to go deal, to go um, check out this ice cave where the townspeople say uh, it's full of loot from raiders who used to ra attack the town. <coughs> Inside the cave, though, uh, the players are going to encounter a demon uh, in disguise. By disguise, I'm expecting that the demon here is going to be uh, likely masquerading as a captive town, uh, townsperson. Uh, we may even, in the setup for this, allude to them having taken to the people, the creatures in the cave having raided the town and taken prisoners recently. Um, that demon persuades the players to activate and then break the first of the magic mirrors, um, which then activates all the other magic mirrors and removes their ability to turn them off. The players, of course, won't know they've done that until the third adventure. But this way we set up a, a perhaps a bit strange, but generally innocuous uh, piece of plot that can happen beforehand, and then we can jump back to it later on when we do the reveal in the third adventure. So today we are building it. We are building a pretty standard dungeon. So it's a cave. Um, it's in a cold valley. And we're going to have to figure out what kind of creatures are, are inhabiting this. We've said that they've been sending out raiders, but we don't really know um, what kind of creatures we're dealing with. We also have to remember that we're dealing with a party who are about 5th level, so this probably isn't going to be kobolds or something that's, you know, classically a weak monster for starting out characters to deal with, um, but something with a bit more meat on it. Uh, so once we've drawn the map out, I'm going to go grab my monster manual, uh, and we'll fill this in with some 5th uh, edition monsters. So that's what's going to happen tonight. Uh, for drawing tonight, I'm trying, instead of using Inkscape, I'm trying to use GIMP, uh, which is another free drawing program, but this is a uh, raster drawing program. So hopefully it should have less pen lag than I was seeing with Inkscape. Um, but the trade-off is we won't be able to uh, have infinite zooming like we do with, it, with the vector drawing program in Inkscape. Um, so anyway, I'm going to try drawing it in this tool. And if this works out, then I'll be using this for my other map drawings. Um, but if not, then I'll go find something else or go back to using Inkscape. Um, it's an adventure, right? So, oh yeah, I guess just quickly, let me pull up um, the area around Tincliffe just so we can remember. Uh, is this the right map? That's not the right map, and it's on the wrong window. Um, you know what? Never mind. I have, the, I have the right map here somewhere, but it's not where I thought it was supposed to be. So um, you'll remember that Tincliffe is in a uh, mountainous river valley. Um, basically, there's a river that a icy river that runs past town uh, from up the valley down to uh, down past the village and into another canyon where there's a larger river. Um, pretty common terrain feature in mountainous regions. Uh, and then up at the head of this river, though, Instead of like coming from a hill or from a lake or something like that, there's an ice cavern that the river flows from or flows near. And so this is going to be this ice cavern is going to be um, our adventure site. So I'm actually going to start from the bottom edge of the map here. 
Um, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to start, you know, about here we'll say, and this cave is going to extend up the page, uh, representing going deeper into the mountain. Yeah. Excuse ah. Sorry about that. Just got some weird taste. What is taste? I don't know. Um, anyway, we're going to go up, the, up deeper into the cave, uh, and probably at the very back we'll have, you know, your pretty standard kind of Legend of Zelda-ish boss fight and then treasure. And that's why the players are going in here to begin with. Um, we talked about motivations. In this case, it's just loot. <coughs> the player characters saved the town, but uh, the town didn't really have much to compensate them with. So, But the town pointed out that, hey, there's this cave up the mountain, where, up the hill, where you guys can probably find some loot, as well as help take care of another problem the town has. So that's kind of where we're going with this. Um, so let's begin. I'm thinking. Uh, let's see. I got my okay. So, I'm thinking we'll start about here with kind of a broad cave mouth. Um, using the D and D slash Pathfinder standards, so that each hex is roughly five feet. But really, I don't like to think about it in terms of actual feet because it makes the scale feel kind of weird. I think it more just like, can I stand? It's, you know, where well, a person can stand and stick their arms out and their swords and stuff, and <clears throat> where a person could stand to fight. So we got about here, and we'll say the cave kind of has a broad, really thick neck like this. Um, so the first area is just going to be this big open space at the front. Now, I kind of explained in my first part, uh, hexes are nice because they change the way the flanking mechanics work. Um, <clears throat> they make it easier to have circular effects that having these kind of weird abstractions that squares have. And most importantly, you don't have to deal with half squares of movement for diagonal movement. Just crossing from one hex to another in any direction is one, uh, is one five, feet, five foot space of movement. Um, <coughs> I also mentioned before that I really like uh, branching pathways. And you better believe that's going to factor heavily uh, into the structure of this dungeon. So we're going to have uh, probably three different ways to actually pass through this place from front to back um, with slightly different encounter setups along each way. Um, overall, though, it's probably not going to be that complicated a dungeon. Maybe we'll have one area that's slightly more built up, like the raiders have actually... Maybe one area <coughs> that's more natural and has some wild animal hazards and one area that has um, that's more engineered and has actual raiders in there. Yeah, I like the sound of that. So we're going to make the right path first, I think. Uh, but basically how this is going to work is it's going to go like this, that way, and we're going to have a fork up that way, and a fork up that way, and a fork up that way. That one didn't draw. And a fork up that way. There we go. Um, that's going to kind of be our structure. And then maybe these ones will come together. And this one will meet it up, up here. And then we have our big, sorry, this is a new tablet. I'm getting used to the uh, feel of it. My old tablet finally bit the, ba bit the biscuit uh, shortly before I started doing this show. <coughs> so we're going to have these kind of three paths. And each area could roughly, as we progress deeper in, uh, we're going to have, <coughs> God help me, I'm coughing like mad here. My lungs are trying to escape, uh, apparently. Uh, we're going to have, we can divide this roughly into, we'll say, four segments. Kind of, we got the neck here. And then we'd have kind of probably uh, the line of the first encounter is going to be like this. Um, and then after these two paths join, we would have kind of another zone maybe like that. Yeah, let's do that. And then we have boss land kind of over here. Um, and these are going to correspond roughly to the kind of acts, if you will, for this dungeon. So we think about the first act. Uh, we're going to establish atmosphere. <coughs> establish atmosphere. I'm going to try sitting a bit further back from the mic. Uh, hopefully sit more upright and maybe I'll stop coughing so much. Uh, so... Or not. 
Mm, I'm dying. Anyway, so in this first area, we're going to establish the atmosphere. Uh, it's a natural cave, but it's got been coated with ice because the walls are leaking and it's dripping down everywhere, and it's winter time. <coughs> Second zone, we're going to kind of have, probably have our first combat encounter. <coughs> I um, this pro this path here is probably going to be the harder path. We might have a bit more treasure. We can, also have, we can also, you know, have hard, medium, and easy paths, although we're, this choice isn't going to be apparent to the players, so it can't be that huge a difference between each path. Um, but we'll introduce the player to whichever branch they've chosen here. Um, so you'd say, you know, natural monster, if this is the natural path. Um, maybe the middle path has more traps, and the, right, and the left path has more um, actual monsters, so we introduce a trap here. Um, and a monster encounter here, or a, a raider encounter here. Um, in the third act, the players kind of get into the swing of things. They know what to expect now, so we throw something slightly bigger at them. Nastier monster, a uh, mix of traps and raiders, maybe. Um, and, and over here, you know, perhaps a bigger group of raiders, maybe they walk through the raiders' canteen or something like that, so there's going to be a big brawl over here. Um, and then kind of up in here, we, <coughs> we might put a lull in here if the difficulty is looking like it's going to be pretty hard and we want to give the players a chance to take a rest. Um, well, the, the rules for 5th edition deal with taking a short rest uh, to recover one's abilities. And if you've cleared out most of the trash that's in here, um, you can take a rest. And then lastly, we would have our boss encounter and our treasure event. The treasure event being the encounter with the uh, demon uh, who tricks them into setting off what's going to be the main plot, but they don't know that. So I think that's what we're going to use for our structure. Uh, let me just grab a new layer here for this. I know I already started drawing walls on that layer, but whatever. <coughs> um, lock. Yeah, okay, there we go. Um, so now we got that walls layer. Let me just uh, da, 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 da. whatever. I'll leave that there. Just as an outline, as an outline to go off of. And now I'll draw in darker lines the actual. So we have what we talk about having this neck here. So I'm just gonna draw over this because it's on the wrong layer. That's not what I wanted. Any artists in the channel? Hey, chat, how you doing? We have a, I know Line Art's in here. He's my kind of go-to artist for uh, doing a lot of the commission work for my other campaign setting. Um, I think 10-foot wide corridors would be fine for the first branch. Maybe I'll make the left branch a bit bigger because there's people living down there. <coughs> so we got any artists in chat? Um, I'm going to explain that the... I like tr roughly following the edges, but not too closely. If it comes to combat in these narrow corridors, we can adjudicate it at the table what the uh, paths are going to look like. And maybe we put a bend in here, make it a bit of a blind corner. All right, and over here, this kind of wider, longer corridor. Now we've got a few artists, that's cool. <coughs> um, bring this guy down around. Yeah, you know, let's make the snake a bit better. We can kind of build up a bit of suspense by just having the the, the corridor suddenly like take weird turns and stuff like that. And um, this way we draw the court, we draw it out more slowly too, so like the players can come across this piece of wall here. And they have to decide now, do I go left or do I go right? <coughs> <clears throat> Viking, I think I know who you are. Uh, I think Viking is a friend of mine. But all are welcome. People I know IRL and people who I do not know IRL. <coughs> okay, so we said we're going to, th in this rough geographic area, and this isn't a hard line, we're going to put somewhere around here uh, we're going to talk about our first. We're going to put in our first encounter. So, um, 
I'm going to not draw this, or this. So this is going to be an encounter room, which means it's probably going to be a bit of an arena. <coughs> um, I want to say also that the right side is more frozen than the left. Like the left side, this is where people are living. <coughs> so, <coughs> hmm. the left side's where people are living. So there's going to be, it's going to be built up. There's going to be, you know, straight cut walls. They got fires, so it's not going to be iced up. The right side's the wild branch. So over here, we're going to have uh, ice flows and, st and uh, stalactites and things like that to contend with. <coughs> Let's draw the, the built-up branch first. So these are raiders, which means they're going to have a, set a series of rooms kind of spread out throughout this whole piece here, and maybe they'll even be adjoining branches across here to cut between them. Um, but probably not, because we want to kind of keep our three-branch structure. Um, but these are raiders, and they'll have, I guess this side's probably gonna be where they're living, and then this side might be where they're storing their equipment, so that's why there's traps and stuff like that over here. Um, I like the feel of that, actually. Maybe we'll put a hidden door in the middle of it so that they, there is some way for the players to discover to go through. It's always nice to have some secrets that are for the players to find, but aren't really consequential. So for our first uh, combat with the raiders, we're just going to kind of have the party happen upon them in this kind of, again, it's not really clear here, but this is going to be a, you know, worked stone, so an actually carved into the rock room, uh, and it'll have a door and stuff like that, but uh, there's going to be this room here. It's a fairly large room. Uh, we're going to say that this is kind of, um, what's this room going to be for? I feel like you always got to have a purpose for a room. I'm going to put a door here. So a note on my um, mapping shorthand, this, like something that looks like that, that's a symbol for a door that goes, in this case, up to down. Um, if I would do a secret door, I do it like this. If the secret door is, you, is visible from one side but not the other, I draw it generally with an arrow through it, so it looks kind of like a dollar sign, but the arrow points to uh, which direction is easier to pass through. Um, so that's kind of my shorthand for... Uh, <coughs> My control key is stuck. That was weird. Okay, so this is going to be the first room. Uh, I feel like we're going to have maybe two baddies in here. You know what? Let's let's pause and think about this for a second. I'm going to go grab my monster manual quickly. Um, I'm thinking orcs. But I want to check um, what we got for DC on orcs in 5th edition. So I will be back in two seconds. Okay, I've got my 5th edition monster manual out, and if anyone wants to uh, follow along, I'll tell you when I land on a page. <coughs> orc. Where is our classic orc? 244. If wizards put this online in some place that would be easily searchable, that would be sweet, but then they wouldn't sell nearly as many books. Um, so shout out to um, Pathfinder for putting their basically entire beastery online. Um, I guess Paizo Publishing <coughs> for putting their entire beastry online. So what we got for challenge ratings on these things? Do do do. <coughs> mm. Mm, where are the challenge ratings on these things? Hell. <coughs> challenge two, challenge two, challenge four, <coughs> challenge a half. So. So okay, so they've got so these orcs are a bit lighter than the ones I'm used to dealing with, but uh, <coughs> a tablet companion that would be nice. That would be a nice feature. Their Dalcos. Um, if anyone from Wizards watches this video, <coughs> um, yeah, more online resources so that you know, for those of us who want to do collaborative stuff, can do this. So let's see. Uh, we have the Orc War Chief at a CR4, which is pretty close to the five we're going for for our players. But remember that we're fighting these in groups. We're not fighting single enemies. Um, we're fighting. We're going to be fighting groups of these things, so we want something 
that's you know a few point a few pigs down on the challenge rating so that we can throw a whole bunch of them at the party uh, and see what happens so let's see mm -hmm. or I can just give these guys a few levels um, in extra abilities I might just wind up doing that give them a few le levels of uh, warrior or fighter I think I'm going to do that actually so uh, So we're going to just rough out what we're going to do for now for the size of the encounters, and then later today if there's time, or next session I guess, uh, we will do what my friend once called demographic engineering, which is to say we're going to make a population of orcs with different class levels, and we'll play that. Uh, so, that's, so that's pretty good, we've already got we're 20 minutes into this video and I've got to plan for next video. Um, speaking of which, if anyone just joined us in the last 20 minutes, this is an interactive weekly podcast. You're encouraged to uh, hop in chat and help me design some of this stuff. Um, don't be afraid. We're all friends here. So um, so this is going to be, I want to say, uh, so this room will be maybe challenge rating. Let's put this at a, this is the hard branch, but it's not going to be super hard yet because this is the first fight that the party are probably going to come across. Uh, in this series. So this is going to be an easy one. This is going to be CR4. CR4 and maybe two uh, two, war two fighters. Note to self, don't write with the tablet, but screw it, we're doing it anyway. So this room, CR4, two fighters. I When I publish this map, I'll clean up the text. <coughs> and I'll probably publish it in a vectorized PDF. <laughs> yeah, Viking, we're not making a tribal chief convention. I'm just going to grab a bunch of basic orcs and give them uh, player character levels, or more likely NPC class levels. Um, and that will actually be an excellent discussion on how to build uh, building enemies that have character class levels, uh, which is a topic that some GMs, I think, uh, would be, might be interested in. Uh, <coughs> let's put some furniture in here. So I'm going to put in the corner here, I'm going to put a nice little round table in a few chairs. It's going to be three chairs kind of at equal at all angles. I know my drawings are really crude, but uh, honestly, I'm an artist uh, with pen and paper, but since I don't have a cam, this is the best I can do. <laughs> so we're dealing with it. Um, and maybe some boxes of equipment here that might provide a uh, loot opportunity. Let's just draw a few boxes there. Uh, shade these in to kind of help tell them apart from the uh, table and chairs. <coughs> so they walk. They basically the party is basically going to walk in on some orcs playing playing cards. Um, they're going to be talking, uh, which means that the players are going to be able to know that they're there, use their stealth abilities, uh, use their perception skills to notice that they're talking to overhear them. Maybe even figure out what they're talking about. Um, it, it can just be something inane. I'll make it up on the spot uh, at the table if I need to. Uh, and then the players can, you know, use their stealth to sneak up on them and get a surprise attack in, which always feels nice uh, for uh, combat. Um. <coughs> so that's going to be the first encounter. Uh, and yeah, this room is just kind of going to be basically just a, I guess, a social room or whatever. Um, then we're going to have behind that kind of the, the barracks and kitchen type area. So let's put in another kind of widish corridor. I feel like extending up this way. And we're going to extend that all the way to the back, basically. Um, it's going to just be a long, straight corridor, and we're going to have some rooms branching off of it. Actually, you know what? Let's go... Let's make this a slightly more interesting. We'll make it a T-shaped T-shaped section. So let me just erase this here. Now the fun part of drawing 90 degree angles with a hexagonal grid. So you get some really weird looking stuff. The key thing is when you're running combat on this, don't stress too much about like half squares and stuff or half hexes and stuff like that. Let the players kind of move how they want to and everyone will have a good time. <coughs> Just remember that 
if you let the players move how they want to, then you can move how you want to also. So there we are. We have this nice kind of cross-shaped, cross-shaped, no, this cross-shaped cross-section, because words. Uh, connect that guy up. There we go. Okay. Um, so this will be the main corridor, and maybe we have a patrol here. Uh, So just a one orc patrol. That's going to be a piddling um, challenge rating for that single orc. <coughs> but he's patrolling. He's not. He's not defending. He's not going to stand there and fight the party. He's going to run. <coughs> he's going to run and make noise, and warn the others, and turn this into a huge mess. This is why this. This is why hey, this side is harder. This is what's really going to set everything off. Is this patrol. <clears throat> the party will need to off this guy quickly uh, before he can make a whole bunch of noise and warn the others. How they do that? Um, it shouldn't be too hard for a fifth level party to kill a single orc. Uh, he'll probably be like a challenge rating three uh, individual there. So the party will be able, should be able to kill him quickly enough. But if they don't, or if they try and sneak up on him and fail or something like that, uh, things going to go to hell pretty fast, and that's going to be interesting. So this is kind of set up a potentially interesting challenge. Uh, over on this side, I think I'm going to put the kit, their kind of kitchen and uh, storage area over here, and then that storage area will nicely intersect with the other area that we're putting a secret door in. So I'm just going to draw a few rooms here. Um... Anyone here play Prison Architect? Basically making a canteen. Good game. Introversion software. Pretty cheap on Steam last I heard. Still in, still in beta though. Uh, so we got this room. We got a couple tables. There's probably some benches. You can draw a bit of detail there. Anyway, so this is a canteen. Um, and then we have storage. Uh, Okay, and somewhere on one of these walls, we'll put in the secret door once we've drawn the other side. Uh. <coughs> uh, we'll probably have a couple orcs in here. Basically, this whole place um, is going to turn into a mess once things get loud. Exactly how big of a mess will depend on how sneaky the party are. Um, I don't have the exact party composition yet, so I don't know if we're going to have a rogue or a sneaky type or if we're just going to be everyone kicking indoors all the time. Either way, though, it's going to be interesting. We're setting up the potential for interesting things to happen uh, without being too specific about what is actually going to happen. Over here, we'll put a uh, sleeping hall. Have a door over here. Um, you know, they probably have beds or something. So some really manky looking beds, but it's just for the description. Uh, and we have some like cabinets or something like that up here for where they store their gear. <coughs> and up here in this area, uh, we are going to put basically loot, but it's going to be where they've got a stash of stuff. Uh, one of their stashes, at least. Uh, maybe in here we put uh, an armory. So um, the armory would be where they would have, you know, weapon racks and probably a forge of some kind. So put some, just draw some equipment in here. And then when we draw this on the grid later when we're playing it, um, we can kind of point out and say what these things are. But this is going to be like a workbench. A workbench and some other pieces of equipment. It doesn't have to be super specific, really. All right, um, and I think this side. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to put leave that blank for now, and we might add some stuff to it. Let's talk about the the middle branch now. 
Now the middle branch, uh, we said was going to be more, a bit more trap focused. Uh, oh yeah, uh, important, this whole mess here, since we said this is the hardest side, this is going to be a CR, uh, we're at 5, so let's do this as a CR 6 to 7. And it's a mess. I can write that better. There we go. It's a CR 6 or 7 mess, basically. Exactly how many orcs are going to be alerted depends on how loud the party are. Um, they could dispatch them all in a string of smaller encounters. <coughs> but the idea is, at some point, the noise of battle is going to attract the rest of them. And it's going to be just a huge mess. Right. This side, I think I'm going to, again, make it blind to the party quite what's up here. By making this natural tunnel kind of have a curve to it. So now when the party are standing at this crossroads, they can't see that there's going to be a wall with a door here. Um, so traps are a tricky thing because they can be trivially defeated um, or they can be, you know, absolutely n n most frustrating thing for players um, to deal with. So that's something we kind of have to be aware of when dealing with a trap situation. Uh, but in this case, um, we're going to have this here. And I feel like the secret door that we're going to get from storage is going to be right here. And that's going to be a secret both ways. Um, it's not going to be an apparent door. Um, so this is going to be a trapped room, um, and basically what's going to happen is the secret door here lets, since you already fought this and probably some of this, it would let you skip those traps, um, if you can, so you just get to the other side quicker. <clears throat> I'll make the other side over here, maybe, I have a corridor that runs kind of this way. This layout's getting less and less logical, but guess what? It doesn't have to be perfect. It was built by orcs, for crying out loud. They're not exactly known for their uh, architectural talent, am I right? Viking asks, in your experience, do parties ever go and try and explore all the paths in multipath situations like this? Um, generally not Viking. Generally, uh, so I've had so few really regular groups of players, so I'm, I will say that a lot of my experience is centered on the same people. Um, people generally aren't going to do an exhaustive search of the entire dungeon, though. Uh, once they've, once you make it clear to them that they've hit kind of what the end is, <coughs> um, they'll usually just want to turn around and go out, because fighting everything in here is going to be more than their characters can take uh, in a single day. They would have to leave and go take an extended rest anyway. Um, generally speaking. So, um, so this has traps. Uh, let's not talk about total CR. That's a stupid thing to do. Traps, um, and that's good. Those traps are going to be in the CR four range, I think. CR four to five. So something the, part, something the party should definitely be able to deal with, but might have trouble if they're unprepared. <coughs> this room will also prove some probably pretty rich loot. Um, but if the party charge straight in and start searching for loot, guess what? They are going to get their asses blown up. Um, because they have to be careful with this sort of thing. Um... And then, let's see, maybe we have, um, we're gonna, we are going to have some combat encounters in here. Uh, so maybe from this room we've got a couple kind of inconsequential side rooms to make it feel more like it's not entirely a purpose-built dungeon. So we've got this, we've got doors here. Um, and we'll put a corridor going this way because we need to get them up eventually towards where that is. I'm going to actually say that this is a corridor that intersects uh, what will be our natural cavern system. So basically the the back of the natural cavern system is going to uh, be intersected with this. Let's do this also. 
No, wait, we said we weren't going to do it that way. That's silly of me. Something more like this. And then they'll have a, cut, a corridor over this way, and that would have met up with the natural cavern. So this is kind of how one represents, uh, kind of you go from an organic shape to, a, to an artificial shape, and then when you look at the map later, it's pretty clear, okay, this is where the worked stone ends and the curvy walls begin. Um, <coughs> and we'll put in a CR5 encounter right here. Uh, I'm not quite sure. We'll probably change it. Let's change the shape of this room a bit, actually. Um, it shouldn't just be a corridor like that. So, no, let's get a bigger eraser, please. That might be too big. Okay, do it very softly. Okay, we're good. And then the pen doesn't go back to this great normal shape size. Great. Just a second. Okay. Um, still learning this piece of software here. This is the GIMP. No pun intended. Um, so we got this here, and I guess we'll probably put a uh, let's put just a big, a nice wide room in here. Like that. Let's make sure that wall is actually the same shape as the other side. Do to do to do. Go like that. There we go. Okay, so we have our nice room here. Uh, what's this room going to be? This is going to be. Um, we will put. Uh, and I'll put a door here. Uh, we're going to put a bookshelf, and this is going to be a small library. And we're going to put the the chieftain. Um, we'll probably have the chieftain as our boss, but we're going to have a mage in here to fight. So this is going to be uh, probably... Mage, um, plus, so we'll, we'll throw in some normal fighters there too, because mages die really fast when a barbarian jumps on them. <coughs> uh, we'll put in mage and we'll make this CR5 probably, just a standard encounter. Okay. Um, so we're kind of getting up to the, the shape of things now. Uh, so we've got two encounters on this side, two encounters here. Although one of them is a one of them is a string of traps, it's still technically an encounter. It's just a it's, it requires a skills instead of uh, fighty bits. Um, you still get XP for traps and all that. Um, I want to say that the boss here. Let's make him. Uh, let's make him a conjurer. He could be a wizard. He can have some summoned beasts around or something like that. That goes nicely with the whole portals and uh, the demon theme that we've got going on. Uh, maybe this conjurer wizard even brought the demon through. Who knows? Um, but we're going to have a kind of large quasi-natural ca cavern here strewn about with loot. Um, we have a large natu kind of natural cavern here strewn about with loot. Uh, and... Uh, uh, Actually, hold on, I want to make a note here. We're going to have... I drew, oh. We're going to have rooms here that contain captive villagers. Um, that way, when we encounter a capt another captive villager who happens to be our disguised demon back here, We've established that there are captive villagers in this dungeon already, uh, so that the players won't be suspicious about how is this person um, stuck here in this cave. Uh, so that will help us uh, 
again with the, the, the so the, the players are going to be manipulated by this creature. We don't want to um, we don't want it to feel too artificial, right? We don't want to feel like we've railroaded the players into this, even though we have. Um, so if we set it up in the the players' minds that okay, they're going to encounter a villager who needs help here, um, that way they will react more natural they will react naturally to it it won't feel strange to them they won't be suspicious and they won't suspect a thing uh which is just how we like it if we're going to be setting up a uh, player manipulation situation so this path um the natural path i feel like can have a few dead ends probably because again it's just a big wet cave i'll put some dead ends in here maybe a larger chamber that doesn't have much of anything in it uh, that the players can then pull the, uh, yeah, the players can f like pull the first combat counter into maybe. I'll go up here and go like yeah, that, and put some stalagmites in. Put some finding at ease. Maybe one of those big back ar big arms back on for good measure. No, um, make it all shiny. Um, we're gonna, well, I'll get the blue out later and I'll put some water or something in this cave probably, but for now we'll just, uh, say that there's a puddle, that there's, uh, yeah, that there's a kind of puddle over here. This is my shorthand for water, it's just these kind of horizontal, um, strokes. Uh, maybe put some cold water here too. So that's how you know it's a really natural cave, is if, if there's, you know, smooth wall, or smooth organically shaped walls, or without square edges and then there's like puddles of water and stuff like that because uh civilized civilized i'm doing air quotes here because these are orcs um civilized creatures are gonna you know have wet water in them and we're gonna have a big beastie who's lurking in here and that will be a cr uh five So unlike the other encounters, where that's going to be a, where it would be a uh, multi-target encounter uh, with several orcs, this is just going to be all the CR, one big CR5 uh, thing lurking around. Um, so the players will come past here, and they'll maybe they'll look in there and immediately see this thing, but then they've got this big room that they can pull it out into and fight with bits of cover and things like that um, to help deal with it. As for as what the CR5 monster will be, um, not sure yet. Um, I have to look up an encounter table for a cold environment, but um, <coughs> maybe maybe a uh, I don't know. I feel like there's there's cold beast. If anyone wants to throw a suggestion in the chat, feel free. Uh, Leonard said bugbears a while back. Uh, is that? Let me take a look at that one. <clears throat> if anyone's joined us in the last uh, 20 or so minutes, this is an interactive podcast. You are invited to participate in chat and make suggestions. Uh, bu 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 bug bears, bug bears. Beholders, bullywogs, bullets. Big light, bug bears. <coughs> Challenge rating three, medium humanoid. Okay, not quite big enough. Not quite big enough. I mean, maybe an ice salamander Viking suggests. Do we have that in our, uh, what we're working off today with our fifth edition book? Uh, I do not have it right here. So uh, we'll come up with something, or I'll come up with something between shows and tell you about it later. I don't have the fifth edition encounter tables memorized yet by any stretch of the imagination um yeah viking we could take an existing creature and redress it um certainly a possibility uh we've kind of i've talked about that before and if it comes to that when we populate this place uh i just might go do that so uh so we have our first encounter here and our next encounter uh, is going to be something slightly bigger i think yeah we can do a Another CR5 maybe in a less opportune situation. Um, let's put a few narrow passages in here just to make it, again, feel, you know, non-constructed. It's just 
and not a safe environment to work in. Uh, make this curve up here and here. Nice kind of kerner there. I put in some more stalagmites. <coughs> and then we have our next room over here, which is going to be a smaller room. Um, so we're going to have a smaller room, and this is going to be a CR, also CR5, but with a lot less space to maneuver in. Um, it could be it could wind up chasing the players into the main room uh, and pushing them back here. If their players are really unlucky and they make a shitload of noise, they might even alert this mage, and suddenly we have a CR7 encounter with two CR5 targets. We don't want that to happen. But it could happen. This is what we call, you know, interesting stuff, right? When the players, when the dice screw the players, or the players make a rash decision, uh, then we get interesting stuff, and that's really a lot of what building up a dungeon is about: is creating the opportunity for these interesting, exciting bits to happen. Um, not necessarily guaranteeing that they'll happen, but making them likely. Um, so. Lastly, we have is this treasure hoard, this kind of back area here. Uh, so I'm basing, uh, I should point out that the, the three encounters per branch thing here is based on my experience with uh, 3.5 and Pathfinder, where combat can take a while, um, where combat can be slow, and as a result, uh, three combat encounters is usually, three good sized combat encounters is usually what we can get in uh, in a normal in a normal play length with the group of players I have. Um, I don't think we need this outlines anymore. There we go. <clears throat> Three combat encounters is usually what roughly what we can get in uh, in an average uh, session um, with talky bits at the beginning and end. So that's kind of what I'm basing off this three encounters per path thing is. Uh, in case y'all were wondering. So we said we're going to have this big multi-chambered room here this multi-chambered natural cavern that's going to be packed. It's basically where they've been dumping all of their loot. All of the stuff that they've stolen from the villagers. So let's just draw it. It's a bit like a misshapen hand there. And again, this is natural, so we're going to have stalagmites and maybe bits of fallen rock. And maybe one really big stalagmite just kind of taking up a huge section of the center here. Like a huge column of ice with some smaller columns sticking up around it. Uh, this is our boss room. So this is going to be our CR7 boss. Um, the CR7 boss is going to be Orc Chieftain um, plus a number of other Orcs. Maybe a Chieftain, a Mage, and two, and two Fighters. Potentially four um, enemies to face, which would then match the, part, match the average party size. Which would mean that uh, we have to make sure the average fighters aren't going to... With that many participants, we don't want to overrun the party. So uh, I have to look carefully at the kind of the challenge rating balance next week when we populate this dungeon. Um, but this is going to be our boss's chamber. Uh, we've got kind of these alcoves and places where the party can, you know, flee back to. Putting these, th putting these stalagmites where there are is so that they can be used as cover by ranged uh, attackers <coughs> to kind of duck behind. Um, but most of the fighting is probably going to take place in this kind of central area here, and it's wide open, and there's kind of a few paths that you can take to sneak around and flank things. But uh, this should be a pretty good mess. And then back in here, uh, we're going to draw a line like this. Actually, let's do... Let's make it look so... We're going to have a line of bars here, and this is going to be our captives. Our single captive that's back here. And I'm thinking maybe we have the captive like posing as a little girl or something like the, the, the demon is disguised as a little girl and says the chieftain is going to perform some kind of horrible blood sacrifice. Um, I think that's the, the right level of evocativeness we're going for with this sort of thing. <coughs> um, 
And then we'll put the mirror nearby too, and the mirror will just be here. Kind of right here. Um, and the captive will say something to the effect of you have to, uh, the bars won't be able to be opened until you've, you know, touched, until you touch the mirror or something like that. Like the bars can be, uh, we can say these are magic bars. I think my writing with this thing has improved slightly. Um, so they're magic bars. So they, they won't have be able to open and the barbarian won't be able to pry them out of the ground. Uh, you'll have to say, you know, the, the captive will say, you can break the spell by breaking that magic, by breaking that mirror that's sitting over there. Uh, and so then again, we, we convince the party to do our thing. Um, the captive that will then say thank you and either run off or disappear to puff of smoke. Uh, not quite sure yet. Um, and then, uh, and then they'll be on their way. Basically, we'll have kicked the story um, into gear. Uh, so this is our uh, dungeon layout for our second dungeon. It's a lot more complicated than our first dungeon, which is pretty typical. Uh, we have some artificial areas, some natural areas. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven encounters to create. Um, with probably three different kinds of orc, the soldier, the mage, and the boss, um, and two uh, natural enemies to encounter. I think probably a single big beast here and maybe a pair of beasts here. Um, not sure. We'll talk about that next week. So next week on the program, we will be populating this dungeon, uh, and I'll be talking about demographic engineering and how to give uh, levels to... Uh, levels to creatures and uh, to enemies, things like that. And uh, we'll be building out these encounters that we will hopefully be balanced. So uh, that's it for tonight's stream. Uh, as always, if you want to use this or uh, make it part of your own campaign, go right ahead. Um, if you distribute it, though, I would like you to send me a tweet. You're free to distribute it as long as you give me credit. But if you send me a tweet, I'll give you a shout out here on the stream. Uh, and then other people who are watching this can go check out your thing. Um, uh, that will be it for tonight. Uh, thank you for watching, and please remember to uh, follow and subscribe. Good night.